Well, uh, Brianna, thank you so much for helping with my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm Brianna Brownell. I'm a data scientist and I've been fascinated by space my whole life. Um, I've always been really interested in physics and, you know, completely loved Stephen Hawking and loved all of those kinds of things. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, data science and what it involves? Uh, how do you go about it? Yeah, well, you know, data science is an interesting field because I started about, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, we didn't even call ourselves data scientists at that time. Um, and the field has really grown to encompass a lot of um, sort of different areas. Um, so as far as what is data science, um, it's sort of a, a um, convergence of things like business intelligence, um, the IT area, um, some of the marketing analytics that, that people used to run. And so um, now it's sort of become this huge field that encompasses a ton of different things within companies. And I mean, and there's so much data to analyze now. I mean, if you just oh, look yeah. at, uh, you know, these rocket launches, I mean, they're like collecting terabytes of data on yeah. like so much stuff. And Absolutely. Well, it's funny because, you know, I sort of came through when, um, you know, computational um, sort of uh, power was just getting better and better, right? And so I remember having to um, sort of write an algorithm and then have to run it overnight to, you know, get the results in the morning. Um, and so now the same thing takes, you know, like a minute or two minutes. And so it's really exciting to see how far the field has gone and how much we can do now. The things that we can do now would have been impossible even five years ago. Yeah, I mean, indeed. I mean, now you can essentially come up with a project and go and rent like millions of computer hours without ever acquiring yeah. a computer and <laughs> get the results back. Yeah, you don't have to buy the expensive like solid state drive. That's what the big thing was when, when I was working. And, and now it's all, you know, you can do things in the cloud and it's much easier, much easier. Now it's about uh, the GPU with the, uh, yeah. you know, the, um, uh, what is it, the Tensor? Uh, In TensorFlow. Yeah, TensorFlow. And yeah. I was looking at a video card the other day and it had like so many, I guess, Tensor threads. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Maybe, okay. So, yeah. Oh, so what kind of technology do you use? Uh, is it like Python and? Uh, yeah, so largely based on Python. Uh, we're actually built on top of TensorFlow. Um, so I love, uh, I love that. Um, but uh, yeah, so our technology um, focuses on um, sort of four different areas, uh, the most interesting of which are unsupervised machine learning, which is um, a way to find emerging patterns in data. Um, so this is, I basically spent my whole career on um, unsupervised machine learning in various uh, sort of areas and capacities. Um, and for me, that's the most important um, part of artificial intelligence right now, because it allows us to find patterns in data that we didn't even know to look for. Um, so that I think is gonna be a huge game changer within the next five or 10 years. Um, and then the second one is uh, natural language understanding. Um, and so the reason that we decided to design technology around uh, natural language was because when I was working as a data scientist in industry, um, we would get these huge data sets uh, filled with text and it was so infuriating and difficult and time consuming and um, it, it was just so hard to do something meaningful with it. But now the technology exists to have really good language modeling through TensorFlow and, and those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of platforms. And we can actually start doing some of these um, sort of extraction jobs um, that were previously all done by hand. And so, um, you know, putting those together, uh, I think is really powerful. And uh, you also mentioned, uh, I guess you're a big fan of Stephen Hawking's. I am a huge fan of Stephen Hawking. Uh, what about him do you like? I think that the thing that really drew me to, to him was um, he would talk about the, the technical aspects um, sort of within physics, some of the, the science around it, um, but also with that sort of philosophy and that sort of humanity around it, um, like asking some of the big questions about, you know, what would it mean if we, you know, discovered intelligent life elsewhere? 
what would it mean, you know, if we could harness the energy of a black hole, for example? And so, you know, that just, of course, made me so, you know, dream about some of these really interesting topics because it was uh, something that could um, sort of connect to, to everyone. Uh, what do you think it would mean if we discovered intelligent life other places in the universe? Well, practically or philosophically? <laughs> um, <laughs> or both? <laughs> uh, I guess uh, both, but let's start with practically. Um, I think it would re be really difficult for um, humans to incorporate that new information into their current wor worldview. Um, if we discovered intelligent life, um, there would be a huge amount of disbelief. I think it would be really difficult for um, people to kind of come on board with it. If you think about, um, you know, scientific, um, you know, facts that we've known for centuries, there are still people who are not on board with, you know, things that we know to, to be true, right? They're the Flat Earth Society and, you know, not a number of others, right? And so I think that um, we would live in a society where um, there would be some portion of the people that believed it to be true and some portion of, of people who would not believe it or they would just sort of not know. They would just wouldn't be um, educated on it. Um, and I think that that would make a really strange world because, you know, you, have, you would have two completely conflicting views about what our place is in the universe. Um, philosophically, I think that it means um, something really profound um, on, about evolution and it means something really profound about sort of the necessity of life um, in space. Yeah, well, I mean, there's also like, uh, did you watch the new uh, Battlestar Galactica remake that oh, they did? Oh, I love the new Battlestar Galactica. Galactica is awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, so kind of like how that, uh, it, it was really thought provoking the way the movie ended as sort of like the beginning of our world, you know? And yes. I was just thinking how easy it would be for us to essentially fall technologically. You know, I mean, at some mm -hmm. point we, um, we, we don't have electricity and uh, you know, we have all these like square looking things around us and there's stories about how people used to hold them up to their head and talk to them. They could yeah. hear voices and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, like the knowledge behind, all of that kind of disappears and then yeah. like this whole religion built around um kind of like uh, brick talking you know <laughs> yeah uh, that comes sure. up. yeah kind of like a cargo cult with cell phones right <laughs> and you could kind of see um you know you could imagine life developing someplace becoming interstellar uh and then settling in another place and then that technology uh is lost Mm -hmm. And then it kind of recreates itself. And yeah. I, you kind of look back at some of, um, uh, you know, some cultures and religions and, and you wonder, you know, how, how could they have gotten there by themselves? You know, like, uh, yeah, was, was it really kind of fallen? So I just wonder if, if maybe it kind of moves to a discussion about, sure, there's life someplace else, but it's really the same life. We just lost touch with it. You know I mean? Like, how would you? That's a really interesting idea, right? You know, so um, being that you could have like a, an interstellar civilization and then, you know, it seems like, um, you know, they've fallen onto a planet, for example, and then now they have to sort of like recreate something new. I think it would depend on whether there was life already there, right? Because, you know, otherwise, how, how do you get the diversity of species except for, you know, whatever the, the civilization kind of brings with it? Um, so, you know, you can imagine a bunch of ways that evolution could, you know, create a completely different and completely new sort of society, um, depending on what, um, you know, what was sort of brought with it. Um, I, I think that's a really interesting thing, uh, interesting thing to think about. Yeah, and also uh, the war, the uh, world, um, I, the author just uh, skipped my mind, but, uh, you know, it was like lived around the 1900s. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about how like these Martians were looking at Earth and they came and yep. uh, and it's amazing how uh, how even that that was like 120 years ago we wrote the book 
uh, yeah. and how much has been kind of confirmed and borne out by our, our probes to Mars and, yeah. and everything else is really amazing. But I often thought, what if we have that in our own solar system? Like uh, Mar um, Elon Musk is actually successful at creating his million person uh, self-sufficient city on Mars. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we kind of have war or plagues or whatever here. And then, you know, that's, that's like real where the, the light of consciousness is. And at some point, you can see our future selves reinvading Earth, you know. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, well, and I think, you know, speaking of the moon, um, you know, I think that the first opportunity uh, that we'll have is to sort of create a place where uh, we can, um, you know, create sort of spaceships on the moon uh, because it's much easier to, you know, reach escape velocity than, you know, on Earth, right? And so, you know, I think um, creating that infrastructure around the moon um, and around, you know, within Earth's orbit to be able to sort of get to that next place, I think is going to be, um, you know, going to be a huge part of how we actually get there and how we spread out sort of a through the solar system and, and uh, you know, through the universe. Yeah, and especially when we consider what we've been able to do with like automation and AI. Yeah. And we, we have self-driving cars. Uh, we have, you know, lights off manufacturing center where literally there's no lights in mm -hmm. the place and it's just turning yeah. out products. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's difficult to convince people, but it's not difficult to imagine the process to build it. Some type of automated system where you're actually kind of prospecting, mining, uh, extracting, refining, yeah. and manufacturing, Absolutely. all completely automated. Yeah, I think that's that's so exciting because, you know, if you think about, so there's kind of two ways to space, I think. Um, the first way is sort of the, you know, government funded, you know, NASA kind of way. Um, and the second one is sort of the private sector, you know, economic kind of way, right? And so really, uh, we're seeing the switch over from one to the other, um, you know, within our lifetimes where all of a sudden we're thinking, okay, well, maybe uh, we could actually, you know, mine asteroids, for example. Maybe we could, um, you know, create a, an infrastructure on the moon that allows us to do manufacturing or something, as you mentioned. Um, and I think that that's really exciting because, you know, it gives us the opportunity to sort of uh, meaningfully sort of spread out um, with the um, infrastructure that we already have. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like you mentioned, uh, getting things from Earth to the moon is difficult, uh, expensive, and takes time. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, sending data around is relatively cheap. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, uh, and that's, that's a hugely interesting thing, I think, because, you know, if we're able to make those sort of connections with you know within the solar system and then outside the solar system you know i think that that's a really interesting um you know possibility especially if we find let's say intelligent life elsewhere um how do we sort of um how do we talk to it what messages can we send um and you know so within the last um you know say 10 years or so there's been a lot of discussion about um should we try to build essentially a chat bot that we could send so that instead of sending one message, right, you send a chat bot so that intelligent life can interact with that, um, that chat bot that sort of um, has, you know, human knowledge It you know, allows them to have a better sort of understanding of our languages, um, all of those kinds of things. And so I think that there's a huge uh, potential for um, artificial intelligence in not just, you know, sort of um, self-replicating systems, data systems, but also to sort of have a meaningful conversation uh, with intelligent life elsewhere. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting uh, looking at what we know about genetics now, about how mm -hmm. much of the genome between very different species is very, very similar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of like epigenetic traits and what have you. Yeah. And, and it almost feels like kind of like one of these recursively expanding yeah systems and mm -hmm. so uh, and and also um you know to send like probes and stuff to the rest of any place else is mm -hmm. really expensive but uh, if you look at like uh, bacteria and spores and 
like mm -hmm. uh, spores, for example. I mean, yeah. they're really hardy to radiation and uh, can live in a vacuum and they're really tiny and yeah. you could produce, you know, trillions of them and just send them in all directions and some of them will land mm -hmm. on uh, uh, worlds like ours and maybe create life and, and some went. I just wondering, you know, kind of what you thought about that, if you thought that yeah, would be. Yeah, it's a very cool idea. You know, I mean, I think that like philosophically, you know, as a human species, we haven't really decided what we want our role to be in sort of um, in the universe. So do we want to say, you know, we believe that um, there should be more life in the universe. Why don't we send, why don't we seed life deliberately to, you know, um, as far as we can within, within our galaxy, for example. Um, because there's a lot of controversy about sending messages to, um, you know, potential intelligent life because, you know, the idea is there, there's a risk inherent to that because what if the intelligent life <laughs> doesn't want us to be here on, on planet Earth, right? Um, and so, you know, we haven't, I don't think, um, scratched the surface on, you know, how we can create some kind of a philosophical framework around what we're doing with space travel like it's it's in such flux um, if you look at you know the first time that we went to the moon and then you know we're going uh, in a few years now um, the landscape of the world is just you know completely completely different right and so you know if you think of that as such a short time scale um, in 200 years 500 years you know hopefully we're going to be able to figure some of these things out yeah, I, I mean, I, I think humanity has a lot to offer, but one for people. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think so too. I think, you know, we, we are, um, I think sometimes down on ourselves for doing um, bad things, which we absolutely do. But, um, you know, humanity has created some pretty amazing inventions and art and, and, you know, civilizations and all sorts of things. But it's really kind of interesting. I, I've talked to some people and it was a blind spot that I had whenever I, I started this project. Um, so it hadn't been a significant number of people, but enough to kind of uh, make me think about a lot more. And that was this idea that we shouldn't go to the moon because we would mess up the moon, just like we've messed up the earth. Yeah. And I, I was thinking, you know, the seed of this was kind of the space program in a way, because mm -hmm. in 1969, whenever we first went to the moon, actually 19... Uh, 68, whenever, was it 68 or 67, when we did the orbit around the moon, um, and we took that Earth Day, you know, that, um, you know, picture yeah. of Earthrise, yeah. and um, within a couple of years of that, you know, we had our first Earth Day, the EPA was founded, and there was this mm -hmm. real environmental movement that got kicked off, um, and, and it's just kind of funny that that environmental movement um, has led us to sort of shaming ourselves to the point mm -hmm. that we feel like we're some type of scourge on the, the rest of the universe and it'd be best to keep us contained yeah. to earth. Well, I think that's too bad because I think that, you know, we, we have a problem right now for sure. Um, but it's not an unsolvable problem. Um, as long as we actually take it seriously and get to work on it. Um, and so I, I really, you know, don't believe that uh, humanity is sort of a scourge. I think that um, the way that we, our, our species has evolved, um, you know, we've evolved a great deal of methods to cooperate with each other and to sort of, um, you know, build something uh, much grander than a lot of the, the other species. I think that, you know, we need to, um be proud of some of those things that we've accomplished like language like art like you know all kinds of different things and so um it's not to say that we're not there aren't things that we've done and are doing that are um, probably you know objectively uh, not the the right thing but um i i really am an optimist in that way i think that we can uh, we can come together and we can um sort of meet the goals that we want to meet yeah, I think we could definitely uh, meet the goals that uh, we want to meet. It's like um, we have all this latent capacity, but it feels to me that to some degree we don't quite have the will to utilize it. I was wondering what you thought about yeah. that. 
Um, I think that part of it is um, when you think about space travel and, you know, sort of going to the moon, um, what that did was sort of inspire people to sort of dream, right? And um, so I think that we need more things like that, where uh, we can kind of see something great and be a part of something great. Um, so one of the, the challenges that we're facing in the modern world is that the communities that we used to have are sort of breaking down um, and becoming virtual. And so you have um, some really strong and really positive virtual communities, um, but you also have sort of the fracturing of some of the communities that exist in the real world. Um, and so being able to do something that brings people together to a common goal, I think is really powerful because I mean, if you look at the history of humans, that's always been our superpower is to be able to sort of come together um, to sort of defeat a common enemy, right? And, you know, it doesn't have to be warlike. It can be something really inspirational. It can say, you know, we want to um, sort of create a great civilization that, you know, spans the solar system that um, is a good part of the galaxy that we live in. Yeah, I definitely. It feels like though that um, we don't quite have uh, the vision around that as a no. society. And that it, you know, we kind of focus everybody's attention on something very, very, very small. Who to vote for in the next ele election cycle, what kind of car to get, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, where are you going to send your children to school and, uh, you know, what kind of house should you get? And it, it's like, it seems like all of that, like so much science has been put and data science too, has uh, been put towards uh, trying to essentially control, understand a large group of people, put something in front of them that would make them react in a certain way to yeah. really get short-term instantaneous results. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's a book uh, that was written, I haven't read the whole thing yet, but the hacking of the American mind talking about kind of like the algorithms that, yeah. and, and even through these interviews, um, you know, it's really kind of highlighted what we get as news is very distinct for each of us too. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I even interviewed one person and they're like, why is NASA keeping it a secret, you know, and about yeah. us going back to the moon, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. and it's just because his news feed has registered different interests than mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. us going back. And I was just wondering, you know, I mean, it, it seems like, it seems like those, it seems like you have some pockets of really futuristic people like, uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk, who's working on uh, building the Starship. And did you see the test flight yesterday of the SN5? I did not. No, I missed it. I'll have to. I'll have to catch it today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no one could fault you for missing it because it was like it felt like the the tenth attempt. By yeah. <laughs> you know, how many times can you? <laughs> they're like the roads closed. The uh, noticed airman's been released. Uh, it's venting. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing's happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think you're right because, you know, we have this idea. So for a long time within advertising, we had this idea that personalization and, you know, niche targeting was what you wanted to do. So, you know, within the data science field, um, almost every data scientist um, is working in some capacity within advertising or marketing. Um, that's just how the field sort of is. Um, and I'm, you know, fortunate in that that's sort of not where um, my company is, uh, but it's a huge amount. Uh, if you think of the talent that is spent on that one, solving that one problem, um, I'm not saying it's not an interesting or important problem, but imagine if we could, you know, have a world where we're incentivized to spend all that brain power on something that sort of much more um, sort of forward looking and something that can bring sort of the whole planet together. And so I think, um, I'm hoping that, you know, some of the sort of new interest in, you know, going to space again and all of these things, the sort of um, how it's becoming um, more affordable. I mean, it's not affordable, but it's becoming more affordable. <laughs> um, I think that those are all good things because, you know, as soon as you democratize 
space travel, a lot of things change because a lot of people can go to space, become interested in it, experience it, and bring those experiences back to their communities, their friends and family, you know, all of that kind of thing. And so um, once we get to the, the point where um, it's affordable for everyone, I think that there's gonna be um, some big changes that happen in what our priorities are as humans. Yeah, and you know, Elon's even mentioned this before in passing about it would be easier for him to build a, a spacecraft that will land on the moon and come back than to convince NASA that it's possible. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. so, you know, once you see it in front of you, I mean, and you know, it, I used to work in residential real estate and, you know, there'd be little minor cosmetic defects with like houses and stuff, but a lot of people can't see beyond, you know, beyond what's in front of them. I mean, yeah. uh, you, I, it's hard to take somebody who's looking at the Wright brothers little plane and trying to explain to them the network of airports and air traffic control mm -hmm. and, and 747s and, and that whole thing that emerged out of it. So, No, it's... absolutely. Well, and I mean, if you look at the way like human innovation, right. Um, and how, you know, these small trends, you know, are small until they're enormous. Like that's sort of the, uh, I, whole idea between, between you know, uh, behind uh, creative destruction, right? And so you have something that's kind of nascent and then all of a sudden it just completely changes everything. Um, you can think of so many examples of, of that, right? So the Wright brothers, as you mentioned, you know, the first car, um, you know, the internet, uh, you know, there's, there's tons of things um, that, you know, have been just a total game changer for human society. And it's hard to speculate you know, what those sort of new technologies might be. Yeah, indeed. And I didn't know if you had uh, more than just 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, oh, I'm good. <laughs> okay, well, let me know when you're not. I have yeah, nothing no, after okay. this. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. So do you remember when you found out that we were going to the moon in 2024? Um, I do because um, I didn't know and it was actually someone suggesting to me that I should um, talk to you about the fact that we're going to the moon in 2024 um, and that's how I, I found out um, and that's scary because you know as we said about news feeds so I follow NASA on you know social media uh, you know I read articles about space all the time so my news feed should have probably picked it up uh, but I didn't know and so I'm glad I do now because now I can you know tell everybody <laughs> awesome and um, I, I guess uh, you mentioned somebody encouraged you to uh, come and and uh, do this interview um, yeah. have any idea on how they found out about it um, I don't know. I think, you know, just sort of from uh, either knowing someone who, who talked with you or, or, you know, something like that. Awesome. Um, and I guess, what do you think it would take for us to actually land on the moon in 2024? Uh, what would it take in terms of the technology that we need or what would? Um, in the whole kit and caboodle, like, um, you know, uh, Jim Bridenstine likes to talk about, the NASA administrator likes to talk about how you have technical risk and you have political risk. And, yeah. you know, the plan uh, before last year was to be on the moon in 2028. And then essentially, mm -hmm. uh, they changed that to 2024. And Bridenstine's like, um, you know, if, if you do things, if you make the goal too far out, then people keep changing what the goal is. But if you could shorten yeah. the time frame and create that urgency and get yeah. it done, you, you reduce these political risk. Um, so, you know, kind of shorten the time frame is one of the things that he felt like was necessary in order to create that, you know, actually produce results. Because back in the, the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, they were talking about going to the moon as well. In fact, mm -hmm. we were supposed to be on the moon uh, this year, according to okay. their plans. Yep. So um, I think one reason that uh, people uh, don't know we're going to the moon in 2024 is just because they've heard all these plans for decades and yep. they're like, why get worked up about it? Yeah, it, that's totally possible. You know, I think 
Um, part of it is that there's, you know, a lot going on in the world right now. I mean, you, you're inundated right now with COVID-19 stories. Like I can't even, <laughs> I open up a magazine and, you know, it's like 90% COVID somehow related to that, right? Um, so right now, as far as what the political risk is, um, you know, even the first time that we went to the moon, um, it was controversial because, you know, like why spend all this money on, you know, on doing this one thing when you could use that money to sort of fix or ameliorate problems that are happening on earth, right? Um, and that's a valid criticism, right? So, you know, why, why are we spending money going to the moon when there are a lot of other things? And, you know, ultimately, I think that the answer is, you know, you ha always have many, many priorities. And, you know, going to the moon, for example, is sort of a scientific mission, it's a technological mission, um, but it's also a mission that um, makes us wonder what is unique or different about being part of human society. And so that I think, um, you know, philosophically is always a positive thing to say, you know, can we dream as a whole, as the whole planet Earth on, you know, the kinds of things that we can do um, when we bring people together. Yeah, and you know, I, I, uh, Jessa a couple of days ago was talking about Space Force and the mm -hmm. militarization of space and how that's kind of introducing the the not all of us are doing together concept. And yeah. I was wondering, I mean, it feels like we've started some trends. Uh, we've started two trends. One is trying to include partners in with the, the going back to the moon. You know, we have uh, Canada working on like the uh, the robotic arm for the... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Canada arm. Exactly. And then um, JAXA, the Japanese um, mm -hmm. uh, agency is, is talking about helping and they have a deal with uh, Toyota where they might create a rover for the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be like a Toyota branded uh, thing. And yeah. Cool. You know, ESA is a big part of it. They've been talking about yeah. their moon village for forever. But then you have uh, China, India, and um, Russia, which, you know, really haven't been incorporated in any way mm -hmm. in doing their own programs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you already have China saying that they see the moon as a strategic asset and they're mm -hmm. exploring, uh, you know, kind of like the, the South Pole region where we know there's water ice, which... Uh, yeah. It's a, somewhat of a scarce resource that we see a lot of use in. And then you kind of look at the, the conflicts we have here on Earth, like with the Spratly Islands and the South China Sea. And mm -hmm. it's very easy to take that conflict and just kind of project it onto the moon and yeah. be right where we were. I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, the potential for, you know, having some conflict and having some challenges is quite high. Um, you know, I think that that's a difficult aspect of, you know, how we're going to move as sort of a human society um, into um, being a spacefaring civilization, um, because, you know, we've created so many amazing things, uh, but there are also sort of challenges inherent to sort of how humans as a whole can collaborate on things. And so um, I, I hope that you know, we can find a way to um, sort of minimize some of those conflicts. But I think that that's always gonna be um, a part of it. I think that that's just sort of baked right in. Even if you look at the rivalry that uh, was what pushed us to get to the moon in the first place, um, you know, having some of those um, tensions uh, has sort of a, a dual effect, you know, some, absolutely negative effects um, and some potential sort of positive effects if it sort of drives us to um, sort of create better and better technology. Like even if you look at the history of tech, um, you know, war and conflict uh, was a huge driving force in so much um, technological development throughout history. And, you know, um, it would be wonderful if we could look back and say, you know, we, we just created these technologies out of the goodness of our heart and, you know, and that was it. Um, but, you know, the truth is a lot of it did come from rivalry and conflict. And so um, 
it's difficult to say, um, you know, that that's sort of necessarily good or bad. I, I think it's absolutely a mixture of both. Um, and, you know, ignoring that is sort of does a disservice to looking at human history. And no, absolutely. I mean, in fact, the internet that we're talking over right now was uh, originally uh, created by DARPA, the technology for it. And yeah. Yeah. one of the reasons why they wanted to have a packet switching network was so that they could have something that could withstand, uh, you know, nodes and links being taken out yeah. during a nuclear mm -hmm. war. So it's kind of um, interesting how that all developed. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you have a sort of, I mean, there's several ways to win a race, you know, if you mm -hmm. look at a foot race, uh, the ideal way is to run faster than your opponent. Um, yeah. But there, there's a lot of um, a less good ways to beat your mm -hmm. opponent too, you know, you you invest in, in some type of gear that helps you run faster, you know, mm -hmm. um, you, you invest in some type of body altering stuff that helps you run faster. And then you can also have the, the option of maybe tripping up your opponent, you know, and mm -hmm. make them run yeah. slower somehow. And, you know, just looking at kind of how we've dealt with other regimes and the vast number of tools that are available to us in terms of like cyber and sabotage and the intelligence mm -hmm. services. I mean, it's, what, what keeps the United States from saying, we're in this conflict with China or Russia, and instead of building a better way to get to the moon, we figure out some way to hamper their program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's unfortunate. Um, you know, I think that you're absolutely right that there's a danger in, you know, sort, sort of trying to um, sort of win by, um, you know, make, so instead of winning, you make your opponent lose. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I mean, even if you look at like the art of war, you know, written, like millennia ago, that's part of it, right? Is the idea of how do you sort of, um, you know, winning is is not necessarily about you being the best, it's about, you know, um, someone coming out the worst, right? Um, and so we need to really think as a society, what we want to be, like what society we want to build and whether we want that to be a sort of valid way to win or if we want to sort of come to a point where we say okay you know we no longer want to um, sort of create a mechanism that um, sort of hampers all of humanity so is that possible to build <laughs> I don't know <laughs> but I would love it if you know we started moving to towards that direction and I think in a lot of ways we have, right? Um, but we still sort of have a ways to go um, to sort of think as um, humanity as a whole. Um, and even though we've sort of started to create some of the um, organizations to try and do those kinds of things, it's been, you know, pretty difficult. Even if you just look within the last, you know, couple years, um, you know, the United Nations, you know, challenges there, the Paris Agreement, um, the World Health Organization, like all of these, you know, organizations that are supposed to be um, sort of worldwide have had sort of inherent challenges. And so I think we're working, we're going in the right direction. Um, it's sort of normal to get to a point, backslide a bit, and then get to a better point. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to catch, you know, a positive momentum in the next, you know, few decades to sort of rebuild and sort of um, figure out what some of those sort of um, global structures might look like. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting though, you know, I mean, before the United Nations, we had the League of Nations, yeah. which was born out of the horrors of World War I. And the American reaction to that was not, hey, this is a great thing, let's support it and, you know, make it to what it, it can. It's like, no, I think we're done with the rest of the world. We're just going to focus on the U.S. Uh, for uh, for now. And then you had World War II, and then the, the invention of the atomic bomb, and mm -hmm. you know, lots of uh, you know, first time to use rockets in warfare. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you had the UN, which was a lot more successful enterprise. But 
I think like in America and Europe, largely, the vast majority of people have no idea what war is really like, what it's like. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so they're really they're really questioning the value of spending energy on things like the United Nations and you know, mm -hmm. diplomacy and what have you. And then plus they're like, you know, we don't even have to risk ourselves. We got drones, we got missiles, you yeah. know, we got mm -hmm. cyber. Um, and they're, you know, and, and like uh, fighting is like kind of glorified in our movies and in our games mm -hmm. and in our stories. And even, you know, uh, the way that the, the people that we kind of honor. And, and it just seems to me that, you know, whenever you add all that up, um, you end up with a great war that destroys civilization on your hands. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I, I just haven't figured out a way to add it up differently. And I, I was, maybe you could help me with that. Um, I would love to figure out a way to add it up differently. I think that, you know, pointing out um, the fact that so many people have not experienced war, I think is, is such a um, sort of profound and powerful um, sort of statement, right? Um, because it's, interesting when you have things that are sort of intergenerational um, sort of concepts or institutions or um, because then you have that um, sort of forgetting because you never personally experienced it your parents maybe never never personally experienced it um, and you were too young when your grandparents experienced it to really kind of have connected with them um, in a sort of meaningful way about it um, and so there's absolutely a danger um, in that. And we're seeing the same danger with the coronavirus pandemic because most of us have never, you know, had to live through something like that, right? And so we were sort of caught unprepared and sort of with a lack of understanding of what, like, you know, what do we do in these kinds of situations? Um, as far as is, you know, the, is there going to be sort of geopolitical challenges in the next little while. Um, I think that probably, um, I'm, but I'm hopeful that um, we will find a better way um, to resolve some of the conflicts rather than, you know, sort of just going to war. Um, having our um, economic situation becoming more and more globalized, more and more interconnected, um, I think is a positive force in that um, it means that um, a country can't sort of unilaterally um, sort of um, take out the ties that they have with any other country. And so um, I think that's a positive, but it doesn't mean that that's gonna sort of keep uh, the house from falling down, right? Um, and so I would love to find a way to add those things up differently, as you said, um, and I hope they will, but I'm not sure exactly what that equation looks like. But, you know, and I mean, we would not have, um, we would have never gone to the moon if it wasn't for World War II, probably, right? I mean, we wouldn't have the yeah. internet. Uh, we wouldn't have, um, you know, cell phones, probably. I think all those things probably had their seeds in the technology that was developed. Mm -hmm. Uh, before, uh, you know, as part of World War II or the Cold War afterwards and and kind of mm -hmm. everything there. So, but, and, and then thinking back, um, I went to Scotland. Um, my, well, my oldest son, he's going to CMU, you know, which is, uh, uh, you, you have Carnegie there. And uh, yeah. I, I went to Scotland uh, where Carnegie was from. And I guess in the process of also reading like a biography about him and the biographer was uh, making the point that uh, his family did not come over here because America was this great opportunity. They mm -hmm. came over here because uh, they had just invested in all their resources and taken out loans to get like these manual looms and mm -hmm. automated looms were taken over and, and they were essentially completely wiped out financially. And they came over uh, here yeah. not because America was this great opportunity. It was because America was the only opportunity for them in the sense mm -hmm. that they couldn't stay where they were. They were completely um, um, lost. And, and whenever you look, you know, I think Jeff Bezos is right about Earth is the only place that's even remotely close fit for humans in the solar system. Mm -hmm. Like 
I mean, Mars, the, the air is like so thin that if you're on the top of like the tallest mountain, mm -hmm. the air is like, you know, multiple times thicker there, right? I mean, that's like a garden mm -hmm. spot compared to, to Mars. And, you know, Gwen Shotwell, the president of um, SpaceX, uh, she mm -hmm. was asked, hey, uh, would you go to Mars? And she's like, you know, it's going to be like camping and I don't like camping. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to Mars, no. Uh, and, you know, to live on Mars is going to be a horrible, horrible experience for those first people. And, and it's really difficult to imagine, I mean, <clears throat> imagine it being something that would be enticing to people. But then whenever you look at, well, <laughs> When, whenever you're looking at, um, you know, a potential annihilation or um, plagues and stuff on Earth, mm -hmm. and you have like this other alternative where you sort of get away from it and start a new beginning and kind of get away from the, the mm -hmm. stuff from Earth. I mean, maybe that's the way the future unfolds. Is... Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there's somewhere in between, um, which is um, structures that are um, human made that are not sort of on a planet or on a moon. Um, so basically O'Neill cylinders or, you know, those kinds of structures, I think that um, we need to start taking that seriously um, and be um, cognizant of how that might be sort of the first step um, to building a larger civilization outside of um, our own planet. Um, I think that the attraction that um, both the moon and Mars have is first of all we can see them you know basically every every day for the moon and you know many days for Mars um, and the other attraction is that you know you get there and you have you know you can put your feet sort of on the ground right um, you know you can look up into the sky you know there's something familiar about that whereas living in a giant cylinder <laughs> um, you know at least the, the artist renderings that I've seen of it, it's a very different life, right? It's a very different structure to how a city looks, how you travel around um, to different places, uh, where you live, how you might have, you know, agriculture, for example, um, you know, what all of the infrastructure looks like. And so um, I think the challenge with um, getting uh, traction for some of those um, different kinds of um, structures is because we can't really imagine or it's very difficult to imagine living in a place where you can't look up into the sky and see the sun um, or at night see the stars and the moon. Instead, you look up and you see essentially an upside down <laughs> city, right? Or, you know, so, you know, there's other kinds of ways that you, that you can kind of structure it. But um, it's a very strange thing. Like even thinking about it right now, I have this feeling of like claustrophobia, you know, like you're inside this tube, right? And so I think part of it is just how do we get used to sort of the different ways that humans can sort of live? Um, and what will we find out about ourselves when we start sort of living in some of these areas? So, you know, not being able to see the horizon, for example, can make you nauseous, right? Just because, you know, you're used to like grounding yourself with that. Um, what if there's never a horizon? Like, are we just gonna all need to, to be taking medication all the time so we don't sort of get sick? Are we gonna have to structure it differently so that, you know, we're always holding on to something so that, you know, we don't fall down? And, and so like, there's all of these questions that, you know, I think that we, need to really think about um to to you know be serious about you know living in space yeah absolutely and you know it's kind of funny i i saw this thing on twitter today um uh, where it was like the sentence that was like very kind of crude and provocative and what have you when you read it but it, it was actually not it's like your your mind auto yeah. automatically like shifted around the letters just because of what you were expecting um, yeah. And there's been times when I, I've been at my house and you like uh, lay down on the floor and you're looking at the ceiling and you're like, I never noticed that vent there, you know, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, you, or you stand on top of a desk and you're like, wow, there's an outlet over there. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, these are little kind of like minor uh, things, but I think humanity 
has uh, kind of like its own filter that we're not even aware of that's keeping us from seeing the universe as it actually exists mm -hmm. because we all have been born on earth we all live with 1g gravity we all live with like yep close to one uh, atmosphere of pressure. We all have about 24 hour days. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I bet you there's some like really obvious things that we're missing just because yeah. we're, we're just like blind to it, you know? And I think whenever we start having people living there, in addition to kind of expanding the physical presence of uh, space, I think it's, it's going to, uh, you know, really challenge that filter and, and maybe we'll be able to see over it, around it, through it, what have mm -hmm. you. And I, I mean, what do you think? Oh, so I actually have kind of a story around that, that, that you might, um, you know, that, that might be sort of dovetail into this. Um, so about uh, a year and a half ago, I think, um, I suddenly lost my sense of taste. Um, so, you know, basically woke up one day, um, you know, had a bite of like my breakfast and spit it out because it, it was just like, there was no taste, right? Um, and what was interesting was, um, so it sort of slowly like came back over the next, um, over the next few months. Um, but what I noticed was all of the foods that I um, enjoyed, um, now I had a whole spectra of different non-taste sort of sensations um, that I sort of felt were either sort of attractive or not attractive. So for example, um, the sort of juiciness, like the, the wateriness of what I ate, all of a sudden became extremely important to how much I enjoyed food, right? Um, so, you know, eating fruit, it was like, the sensation of sort of cold water, because I couldn't taste anything, but if I had, let's say a plum, I could feel that, right? Um, the texture, for example, of ice cream. So I tried ice cream and um, I couldn't eat it because it felt like I was eating um, cold butter because the texture was the same as, you know, what cold butter would be. And so it was like taking a spoonful of cold butter. Um, and so I think you're, absolutely right that there are all of these sort of things that um, our brains kind of um, pick up that are almost like masked by the world that we live in now so as you mentioned you know 1g as you mentioned you know like sort of a, a similar sort of you know style of you know having the sky above us and and you know ground below like all of these different things i think um we're gonna all of a sudden find out um, just how complex some of the things that we took for granted actually are. Even if you just look at, um, uh, even if you just look at the difference between sort of um, gravity and like momentum, right? So we think we have kind of an understanding of how moment, momentum works, right? And we do in this world, like if I take a ball and I throw it, I kind of know approximately how far it's going to go. Um, but then with, you know, different, um, you know, different gravity, it's going to be a surprise and we're not going to, you know, figure it out right away. And it's going to be kind of a challenging transition because um, things will happen that we're going to think are very surprising. Um, it's going to be, you know, a very interesting and sort of different experience, I think. Yeah, definitely. How long did you go about taste? Um, about, uh, about two months, uh, like, and it, it started coming back um, sort of pretty, um, you know, within a few weeks, but uh, it was, so I love, you know, like sort of different foods and I love to cook and all this. And so for me, it was just like the craziest, you know, experience because um, I, um, so one of the things that I hate is blackberries. So I just cannot stand them. And so a friend of mine challenged me and said, like, can you like blackberries? You have to try it. And so um, when I ate them, I love them because, you know, they had this kind of like liquidy texture and interesting. And so when I couldn't taste them, I actually really liked blackberries. And then when my taste comes back now, I still hate them. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I love the taste of blackberries, but one thing I hate about it is like the little bitty seeds. Like they're always like bugging yeah. me. They're getting between my teeth and 
<laughs> and, uh, but uh, so that wasn't a problem. It seems like you would have a heightened awareness to the little bitty seed, mm -hmm. if you, especially yeah. if you didn't like the taste. Yeah, it was everything. What like all of the textures were like. So the temperature and the textures were super important to whether or not I enjoyed anything. Um, so if it was like the wrong temperature, I wouldn't like it. If it was, you know, the a weird texture, I wouldn't like it. And so. Um, it was really strange because I started eating very different or started liking very different foods um, for, for that reason. Um, any ideas on what caused it? Um, so it's actually uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, so I was diagnosed about um, uh, six months or maybe a year ago. Yeah. Um, and so it's uh, that was sort of my first uh, flare up with it. And so it was uh, quite the um, quite the different experience. My neurologist said that um, it's only the second time she's seen that um, as the first, uh, like as a presentation for MS. So, wow, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, so it's something that might uh, you you might experience again, I guess. It might be, yeah. Um, so you know, it's interesting for me because you know, working in AI it's allowed me to think about my brain in a very different way. Um, because when I think about the ways that um, I kind of understood um, and sort of sensed, um, you know, food through other methods aside from taste, um, it really made me think about how our brains work and how we can build an AI system uh, that can incorporate, you know, some of those things in it. So like, if you imagine building an AI system, um, so things like food texture and temperature are not nearly as important um, as taste is in you know, whether or not you like a food, right? Um, and so if you imagine building a, a neural network to you know, say, say like or dislike something, um, and then sort of remove one input, right, into, into that, um, you can see how um, easily it would just completely break down and so you know it, it actually ended up being kind of a positive in my life like I mean I it's you know not maybe a, a net positive forever but um, even just being able to understand how my own brain worked and kind of do some of those experiments um, was kind of an interesting experience. Um, so another Elon Musk company Neuralink have you heard of them? Mm -hmm. I have absolutely. And what do you think about that? Um, I'm going to be like first on the list for that. Um, so the other thing that uh, I want to be first on the list for is um, any kind of like mobility thing. So I, I jokingly say that I'm going to get robot legs as soon as I can. Um, so that I think is very attractive. Um, the idea that we could create for ourselves new senses, I find a absolutely fascinating and um, very interesting, very provocative question. Um, have you read the book, uh, Tuesdays with Maury? No. Oh, okay. I, anyway, it's, it's, it's a, a good um, uh, philosophical book about the meaning of life and stuff, but he has a degenerative uh, neurological disease in it. And yeah. essentially uh, one of his old classmates, um, one of his old students that, was um, uh, really close to him who they completely lost touch with for like yeah. 20 or 30 years gets back in touch and uh, it, it's a it's a good book I think you did yeah enjoy it. cool no absolutely yeah um so if you look out 500 years from now do you see humanity still just on the earth making like little day trips places and exploring uh, or do you really see like the solar system filled with like these O'Neillian structures and you know we've we're mining asteroids and we're on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and like how far do we get in yeah. 500 years? Um, I think definitely um, O'Neill cylinders are going to be um, I, I think that's a close to within my lifetime thing that's going to happen um, you know we it may not be anyone can sort of go there or you know, it might be sort of a, a prototype, um, but I think that that's something that's um, very possible and very likely to happen. Um, as far as colonizing the planets, um, there are, the challenge with that is, I mean, the only one that's sort of viable is, 
is Mars plus, you know, a couple moons like Jupiter's moons and Saturn's moons are, you know, maybe potentials. Um, you know, the challenges there is sort of getting the equipment that far, right? Um, and also um, sort of building the infrastructure sort of on that planet. Um, I actually think that we're going to go to um, sort of space structures that are um, sort of self-sustaining before we'll, you know, meaningfully colonize um, sort of planets and moons. Um, but having said that, I would love to live on a moon just to imagine um, the what the planet rise and the sunrise would look like, I think would be a really, really interesting and very different sort of phenomena to kind of live in a world like that where you have a planet rise and you have a, a sunrise as well. I think that's to me very, you know, a very attractive kind of a um, place to live. Um, so maybe it'll just be the, the you know, uh, really affluent people who want to have that really unique experience that will um, go to those types of places and all of the people who can't afford it will be stuck on O'Neill cylinders with me. <laughs> well, I mean, we kind of touched on several technologies that lead up to what's the true future for humanity and us as individuals. I mean, we talked about AI chatbots being sent yeah. out to other civilizations. Uh, we talked about Neuralink. We talked about robotic mm -hmm. legs. Yeah. Um, and uh, we also talked about the kind of like the harshness of these places. Um, and, you know, the, our real identity is probably inside of our brains and that, you know, weighted connections mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. uh, all of our, our neurons and the, the pattern and stuff. Um, do we at some point just get rid of our bodies? And You know, that is something that I've thought about quite a bit. And I think that um, there's a very interesting potential in sort of digitization. Um, so we, at this point, don't understand our brain and our body well enough to do a um, good enough job for it to be sort of um, complete. Um, but I'm not so sure that that is, you know, all that far away. I mean, in if you look at time scales, within a few generations, I think that there there will be um, a possibility to sort of do something like that, where uh, we decide what kinds of, let's say, sensory inputs we want to have on our bodies. Uh, we decide what kinds of, um, you know, sort of base level wiring that you know we want um, and we'll actually be able to do some of those things both biologically as well as sort of with technology and so you know i i think that it's um neuralink is sort of a, a first step uh, but there's other folks who are working on sort of how do you um sort of augment um, the human reality uh, with technology um, so, so far, we've really done um, tools that are kind of, you know, physical objects that are sort of outside of our body, right? Um, but that is going to sort of change more and more. Um, and I think that, that the possibilities that that unlocks are, you know, really, really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, we're already kind of uh, instrument, in, instrumentally our bodies with our wearables yeah. and the aura ring and yeah. continuous glucose yeah. monitoring and you know Neuralink yeah. and uh, all this and um, it, it's kind of I mean it's challenging to really think what it means to be human I mean like yeah. uh, I mean uh, I mean what 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 am I you know I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, Oh yeah, I think that you know that's that's right on, and you know that's a question that I'm really working on as well. Is you know because there's so many of these AI systems um, that are becoming um, closer and closer to be able to do things that uh, we previously thought that only humans could do. And so, what does it mean when we have a you know a technology that could um, sort of think and you know perform tasks in a way that is you know, sort of uncannily human um, and it wasn't so long ago that we thought that you know computers could never be good at chess because um, you know chess had such a sort of beautiful um, intuition around it and 
um, not only did we build sort of new chess playing machines, um, but it also taught us a ton about how to do well at chess, right? And so, you know, it's not about replacing things that humans can do. It's about, can we augment what humans can do and then use technology to better understand our own selves? And so to me, that's sort of the, you know, number one goal that I have in my life, I guess. Well, and I, I mean, uh, one thing that makes us different is what we like to do and the things we like, the foods we like, um, yeah. and, and these types of things. But at the same token, all of those sort of preferences have repercussions, uh, which have mm -hmm. negative and positive consequences on our, our lives. And at some point, whenever we optimize everything to be like the best, then maybe mm -hmm. we even lose those preferences. Like, I mean, in the case of uh, blackberries, for example, if uh, suddenly yeah. you're in a, a situation where all you have is blackberries, not liking blackberries is gonna be a big disadvantage. What a nightmare. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, and, and that could be with like anything. Um, I mean, oh, another thing is I like to, to read. Um, and it's not just about absolute, you know, absorbing the information. It's actually the whole experience of reading something about the, the fill of the pages, the smell of the book, uh, holding in my hand, kind of feeling like I'm making that progress and, and what have you. But, you know, whenever it's possible just to kind of upload that story, you know, liking to read becomes a disadvantage. Um, mm -hmm. And, but yet you feel like you lost part of yourself whenever you give it up. Well, it's interesting because, you know, like, I think that we think that we're more static than we are as humans, right? I mean, if you look back at, you know, who you were 10 years ago, um, you know, you probably were very different and had, you know, a lot of different interests and, um, you know, a lot of different sort of day to day. Um, and then, but if you sort of project out 10 years from now, um, it sort of seems like, well, you know, things will probably be pretty similar. I think that we like consistently underestimate how much we actually sort of change throughout our lives. So um, it, it would be interesting to see um, if, you know, reading, for example, um, perhaps it's the sort of calm, sort of tactile nature of reading that is what you are enjoying about it. Um, so maybe instead of reading um, in the future, it would be uh, virtual reality experiences that take you through a story. It's tactile. You know, it's something that, you know, you can follow an interesting narrative and you can sort of be a part of that, that sort of story. Um, so it's not that, you know, you've given up reading. It's that, you know, you've always enjoyed a certain sort of style of experience. Um, and now we have new experiences that are in a similar style. Yeah. And, uh, you know, those could be really immersive experiences okay. that, yeah. uh, you know, you're not just reading about this village on the, the lake, but you're feeling the wind and you're smelling the salt and you feel the exactly. sun on. And, um, you know, so this kind of opens up a whole nother philosophical thing about <laughs> obviously our ability to simulate these environments is going to get better and better and better. And at mm -hmm. some point you can imagine a future where it is so good that there yeah. is no difference. Like you won't be able to tell that you're in the game versus yeah. out of the game in the experience versus mm -hmm. out of the experience. And if that point could exist in the future, there's going to be way more people in these experiences after that point than, than before, of course, mm -hmm. because nobody's in it before. And if that's possible, then who's to say that we haven't actually already done that and we're... <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, you know, that has been quite the debate for, you know, well, decades for sure, even since the Matrix, right? Um, you know, and I'm, I'm certain it's, it's sort of, its origin is, is before that, right? Um, I think that, you know, virtual worlds um, do provide a, you know, huge, another fascinating sort of aspect of, you know, exploring what it means to be human 
uh, when we're so augmented with technology. So I, I love virtual reality. I'm a huge fan with VR. And, um, and what I find is um, I love the sort of um, creative kind of experiences that you can have in a virtual world that you can't have in the physical world. Um, and so, you know, to me, um, if we move into um, sort of having more and more virtual experiences, it is going to be difficult for people to, um, like I've noticed even myself, um, going in and out of um, some of the experiences, um, that it can kind of be jarring to, to sort of move between them. Um, because when you um, sort of play for a while or when you're in those, those you know, virtual worlds for a while, um, it really does become immersive and you really do feel um, sort of you lose your sense of, you know, where you, you are in sort of the real world. And so um, I think that it's only going to get more and more um, intense with sort of creating some of these virtual spaces. Um, and what it, as for what it means for um, how we move forward and whether we essentially create ourselves permanent virtual worlds. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know. I think that that's a really interesting question. Um, I wonder whether if, you know, I, I was building a virtual world, if I would have created, you know, what's going on right now. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I mean, I guess uh, the game designer maybe has different ideas than, than what I think would be a good world to create. I know they even touched on that point in the matrix, right? About how that the first virtual world was perfect, but people yeah. kept, uh, you know, getting yeah. out of it because their mind just completely refused to accept it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if it was safe and affordable, uh, would you go to space? Absolutely. A hundred percent. I'd be, um, right on there. I think that for me, um, the idea of being able to see, um how sort of small our planet is um i think would be a really profound experience because one of the things that i think is real challenging um, for everyone is you know we all are sort of the the center of our own very special story right we're all you know we have our lives we have our you know friends and our family and our life and and you know so we're so self-focused and we think that everything is a, a, a big deal, right? Because it, it happens to us and, you know, um, and I think that getting the perspective of how insignificant some of those things actually are is a really freeing way to think about our lives. If I look at, you know, the entire planet and I can't even, you know, see the dot of, you know, sort of, sort of, where I, I might be on that globe, I think that it's an empowering thought that makes a lot of things potentially possible because all of a sudden you're freed from worrying about those day-to-day -day things that we spend 90% of our time and energy on that end up actually not being important at all. And so having a way to gain a perspective like that is the number one most um, compelling thing to me about being able to go to space. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to think of um, astronauts that went on later to really make significant contributions. I mean, we of course have John Glenn that became a senator, Harrison Schmidt that became a senator. But uh, aside, I mean, like what astronaut who's had that perspective has come back and really done something productive with it. I, I... Well, I mean, the, the challenge is there just haven't really been that many sort of astronauts. And the other challenge is almost all of the astronauts um, have had a very specific narrow background. Um, so if, if you basically didn't um, train as a like a pilot and also you know do sort of uh, some sort of scientific advanced scientific um, you know research you you know it was something that you sort of essentially couldn't do right um, so I think that there's two parts to that um, I think that it's not that the, the things that astronauts have done um, aren't sort of game-changing or world-changing 
um, I think that we just haven't given the opportunity to enough different people um, to be able to experience that. And so um, for me, having um, space travel be sort of cheaper and easier and safer um, allows you to send, you know, artists to space and musicians to space and, you know, like technologists to space, hopefully that's me, <laughs> you know, and so um, it, it really opens up a lot of possibility because now all of a sudden you have uh, people with very different perspectives and very different backgrounds um, who can sort of share an experience that that's really sort of different. Um, have you heard of the Dear Moon Project? Uh, I don't think so, no. Okay, so there's this Japanese uh, billionaire who's contracted okay. with SpaceX to send, I think, like uh, nine, uh, around nine artists around the moon in 2023. Okay. Ass assuming that awesome. uh, uh, Starship happens. And, you know, it kind of uh, brings up the thought that uh, we, we purposely sent people that were maybe a little too stable to space unable yeah. to be reactive <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know they look out the window and they're more concerned about the orientation of the uh spacecraft yeah. than the oh my <laughs> gosh look at this view yeah. um and so I, I just um i mean it just feels like that like you said we, we purposely sent people that wouldn't be affected by this amazing thing uh, mm -hmm. just you know yeah. and, and as we send more people it's it's going to be Great. Of course, it may be overwhelming for some of them. It'd be kind of interesting <laughs> to see if, if it's like really too traumatic and they have to spend some yeah. time kind of coming out of this, yeah. Yeah. this issue. But yeah. Um, so I guess ask me that same question uh, about, you know, whether it's worthwhile to send people to space because they contribute till, you know, let's say 10 years after. So 2033, we'll, we'll catch up and <laughs> oh yeah see, for sure talk about those those artists and see if they contributed yeah I exactly and you know they may not contribute uh directly right i, I mean yeah they're they're communicators um that communicate on like a very emotional um you know mm -hmm. uh level uh so maybe they inspire other people and, and maybe that's mm -hmm. what we got out of our um astronauts too yeah for sure yeah um, so how far would you go? Like uh, orbit, the moon, uh, multiple years to Mars? Um, so the, the multiple years to Mars, um, I think, is to me the most challenging one, um, because I think that uh, at least the technology as it exists today, um, it means very close quarters, it means very long time frames, and you know, there, uh, you can't have very many people at once in sort of the spacecraft. Um, so the challenging thing um, for me in, in that regard is that I think it would be very difficult to sort of keep your um, sort of routine and sanity for that long in that close quarters. Um, like even during, you know, the um, coronavirus, you know, having so my, my husband was working in, in the U.S. and so um, came back to Canada and, and we had to self-isolate for two weeks, right? Um, two weeks where, and so uh, part of the um, part of the rules were you were, you couldn't go outside, right? Um, so we have a like a balcony, so we could sort of go <laughs> outside-ish, right? Um, but it was actually much more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, I think before um, you know COVID nineteen hit, I thought, oh yeah, like I could, I guess I could spend you know fourteen days inside. There's enough to do. There's whatever. Um, but I actually found it really difficult. And so um, I think that that would be really challenging because it's not just, you know, two weeks, it's like months and, you know, months and years, right? Yeah, in, indeed. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's like that Mars One project where all these people mm -hmm. apparently were like, hey, we'll go on a one-way trip to Mars. Yeah. I wonder how many of them now, having been through the lockdowns, would be like, you know... <laughs> Maybe you not. know, that's a good question, um, because I think that we just haven't kind of practiced, right? Like, I mean, I think that if you kind of practiced and got your sort of routine down, and, and I think that that would be, um, like, that would be really different. But, um, 
like the one thing that I found is being inside all the time that I almost got like, um, is it agoraphobia or like where you, you know? Oh yeah. Where you're afraid of open spaces. Yeah. So when I went out for like the first time, you know, outside, I was like, Oh, this feels weird. And you know, like this is very strange. And so I wonder if it actually really sort of affected me even just that short time. Right. And so, you know, going back to what we were saying about how weird it would be to live in an O'Neill cylinder, well, maybe all the people who live there would just all be essentially like agoraphobic and you could never um, allow people, because they're living there their entire lifetime. And then if all of a sudden they see space and see, you know, like, it might just be like a really traumatic experience for them. Yeah. I I know. And then... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's 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 difficult. The the future is going to be interesting. Yeah, so. it sure is. Yeah. Well, I um really appreciate your time. Is there anything that you want to talk yeah. about that we didn't get to? No, we sure got through a lot actually. So it's it's been just a wonderful conversation, and you know I enjoyed it very much. There's uh, so much interesting um, in you know all of these topics. Yeah, it'd be. I look forward to seeing how it turns out. Um, I keep thinking about this project from the standpoint of 2050, there's a high school student on the moon doing a, a research paper on what people were yeah. thinking right before we... Oh yeah, that would be amazing. I, I hope they I hope they find these interviews for sure. Okay, well, you have a good rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll Bye-bye.